Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to another episode of On the Couch with Creatives. I say good morning, but good evening, good afternoon, if you're anywhere else in the world. As you know by now, if you've been with us for a while, we are part of the Creatives Group, a private network for creative professionals to grow and develop their creative businesses together. I'm Melanie Perry. And I'm Julie Hyde-Mew. So tell us, Julie, who is our very special guest today? Well, today on the couch, we have an author, Dylan Brennan, and he's just published his debut novel called Noble Betrayed. And it's been described as a thought provoking fusion of the sword swinging army inspired medieval tales of political intrigue and love and death and honor familial love and the grave consequences that history can have on society as a whole and this book is a fantasy but it's also very real sounds pretty chunky uh, but what's even more remarkable about this book is that it's been written by an author who is only 16 years old hello Dylan welcome to On the Couch hi thank you for having me were you 16 years old um, when you wrote it or were you 15 and you're now 16? Uh, I was 14 when I started it. Yeah, I started it back in quarantine. Wow. Wow, under lockdown. So obviously a writing prodigy. Um, so what what sparked off the idea? Well, I've always loved fantasy just as a genre. I mean, I love like, I love Lord of the Rings. I love Game of Thrones or all of those. So my passion for English and just the, I guess, sort of the boredom of quarantine. Uh, it, it, I felt like it gave me the perfect opportunity to write an, my own entry into the genre and realize my dream, I guess. Wow. that That's pretty epic. I mean, Julie and I have seen that over lockdown, such creativity was born from so many people. But to actually write and get published is is pretty, pretty awesome. Um, your tale is is kind of set in medieval times. And it's a fantasy. Is it a purely human fiction, or do you have mythical creatures like dragons in your book as well? Uh, I don't have dragons, but I do have a couple other mythical creatures. There is a griffin, but it's uh, it's still a, as a baby right now. Uh, but uh, for the most part, it does just focus on human nature and uh, the quarrels between humans. And is this going to be, is this the first of a saga? Or are you going to carry on writing books, carrying on with the whole story? Yeah, I, I plan on probably doing a trilogy, yeah. That's the thing about fantasy, isn't it? It's wonderful to, to escape to a world and you can just go anywhere with it. Um, I think that's that's the beauty of it. You know, you can go on and on and on. And um, it's funny because I'm a filmmaker and as I was reading um the, the synopsis of your book and I'm I'm very visual so I was seeing imagery flash past my eyes I thought you know this would make a good film <laughs> it would make a good film so that'll be the next thing won't it Dylan you'll be selling the rights to um you know Disney or Warner Brothers or something like that yeah hopefully <laughs> another Game of Thrones saga in the making <laughs> yeah but people love that people love that people like to escape and, and I do when I watch tv um I'm much more likely to watch Game of Thrones or something than Coronation Street I have to admit because I like to get away when I watch the tv I don't want to watch the same nitty-gritty life drama play out that I'm trying to get away from you know at least if you've got dragons and nice clothes and costumes and things it's, it makes it a bit more bearable it's the same kind of drama but it makes it a bit more bearable doesn't it when you've got better things to watch tell us a bit about the story give us a bit of the plot okay so um it's very hard to summarize <laughs> the plot just because the book is so big but um the main protagonist is uh this man called lord simon pajan and uh he's the lord of uh house pajan obviously and his father uh used to serve the the current king and helped him actually rise to the crown and um since and however he, he's not any he's nothing like his father he's just become quite reserved he's quite callous he doesn't really want anything to do with the crown now but um eventually he gets called up by his old friend the king whose name is Emenar, to uh serve as high in uh, the kingdom 
and Hayal is one of the most influential bazins. It's basically the second in command. Um, however, it's uh, at the uh, it, it's at it's at the perfect time for disaster um, because he he used to domestically abuse his wife uh, Gwendis, and because of that, she sees it as the perfect opportunity to um, get revenge on him, and she leads an uprising against him. And then as well, that there's also a plot to assassinate the king, which has just been unearthed by the council. And because of that, there are many casualties, and everything just descends. Wow, there's a lot going on. A lot going on. Yeah. yeah. Is it is it a mythical country? What is what is the name of the country? It's just called the Great Kingdom, but I've done that on purpose. There, there's a reason why it doesn't have a specific name. What and what is the reason? It's uh, it, that uh, ventures into spoiler territory. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. So people have to buy it and read it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And you self-published, didn't you? You went the self. I did. Yeah. So how do you actually go about that? Because there are plenty of people who write novels and then it's so difficult to get an agent. It's difficult to get a publisher. A lot of people are self-publishing these days. You, uh, so tell us how you went about it. Uh, it's actually a lot easier than uh, most people think that it is. Um, it, all you really have to do is pick a platform and then just get all the materials ready that they need. You need to decide on things yourself like price, You'll probably need to hire someone to design the cover for you unless you're good at art yourself, things like that. But then, yeah, it's just a matter of uploading it and then doing your own marketing to get um, the sales. Marketing is really where it, it, what it all revolves around. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is very difficult for um, some creative people because they live inside their heads. And to go out mm -hmm. into the big wide world, especially somebody like a writer or an artist, and to market themselves and, and, and sit themselves on a podium and say, hey, look at me, look what I've done. It's quite difficult. Are you finding that difficult, marketing yourself? I haven't, I, I haven't had any prior experience with it. So yeah, that does make it a bit difficult, but I'm, I'm doing my best, yeah. Uh, I, I'm still focusing on the social media side right now, but then I also have amazing opportunities like this, which are definitely helping me as well. Well, that's where I actually found you. I was trawling through uh, Facebook, and I and you and you and your book suddenly popped up, and I thought, "Wow, <laughs> how remarkable that somebody has just published a huge, big fantasy book at the age of sixteen. That is amazing." And as you say, you certainly got yourself out on social media because I certainly saw you. So, uh, well done, you. And is this this is I, I guess what you want to do? I mean, you're, you're only sixteen, but it. it have you always felt that you wanted to be an author and that you want that's what you want to do you want to create these novels for everyone to share is that is that your calling would you say yeah i i think i'd rather just do it as more of a side career rather than my main career but yeah i i definitely want to carry on writing books it, it's always writing's always been a passion of mine so well you've just um you have a remarkable academic uh, um Maria, you've just uh, uh, what? Just had how many GCSEs that you've you've gained? I gained eleven GCSEs and I got a grade nine in all of them. Wow! So what what are you hoping to do? Go to university and um, and study something else? Yeah. So now I'm doing my A levels. So I, I've chosen English, maths, and computer science. So for the next two years, I'm going to be studying those, and then when then obviously the next step is university and uh, I plan on probably going into law. Wow, interesting. I bet you could pick up some stories if you go into the legal career. You could craft yeah. some pretty good, you could craft some pretty good uh, fantasy fiction from that, I would think. Well, crime novels and true crime fiction um, is very popular. Are you? Do you see yourself going into different genres or staying with the fantasy type of stories? Yeah, I've I've actually already made some drafts for stories that aren't fantasy. So I, I do definitely plan on straying from the fantasy genre a little bit. But I will always, I mean, novel, the novel series will always be close to my heart because it's my first series. So I, I'll always love fantasy. Yeah. So you, you've already planned out the story, right? You've planned out the next two books. You're already yeah. writing them? Yeah, I've already started back on the second one. I think I've done about 90-ish pages. Oh. 
And how, I mean, you're very young. How long does it take you to create these books? How long did it take you to, to create your, your first book? And how much time do you set aside? Because we had an author on a little while ago and uh, she gave us a lovely top tip about being disciplined, you know, having to set yourself a certain time of the day that you just sit and write and, and get it done. Do you have a process that you that you use? Yeah, so my process is write your first draft for the first chapter that you're doing, then go to your to your second one. But then after you do that, go back and proofread what you've already done and then just repeat that process with each new chapter that you write. It is quite lengthy, but I think it's the best way of preventing plot holes because especially with a story like mine, which is so convoluted, and there are so many storylines that intertwine at random points and everything that happens can impact tons of characters in some way. Uh, I, I think that's the best way to go about it rather than leaving all your proofreading until the end because it's so, you've written about 500 pages. It's a lot easier to miss things. Yeah, yeah that's that's what a lot of authors say. You, you, you write, uh, but before you sit down in the morning, you go over what you did the day before, edit, as you say, proofread, edit, uh, check out if there are any plot uh, plot holes. Uh, that certainly seems to be a, a proven um, way of doing things. And who else proofreads your your work? Do you, do you give it to your mum or, or friends or who who are your trusted little circle that, that sense check for you? Yeah, so it's usually just my parents. Uh, I did give my friends a, I think about, 30 40 page sample as well but i didn't want to give them the whole thing <laughs> yeah no they need to buy the book yeah <laughs> <laughs> so how do people buy the book where is it selling it's selling uh exclusively on amazon if you search to noble betrayed dylan brennan it would come up as the first result yeah and we'll have those details going across the screen as well so you can plug that in and go and check it out i mean i I, I mean, I think it's wonderful, to be honest, because, you know, writing a book is hard enough. I don't think I could do it. But writing a book that, as you say, is so convoluted. I mean, did you did you ever have a moment where you did? I'm not going to swear. Mess it oh, up. <laughs> mess it up. There's children present where you messed it up and you, you had to go back and, and, and redo the, the thing because when you've got so many things as you've just said coming together that must be incredibly easy to mess it up at some point <laughs> and, and suddenly go along and think oh my goodness no I can't do that have you ever had a moment like yeah, that so the, the first thing the first thing that comes to mind when when you say that is with the baby griffin character that I mentioned earlier uh he sort of serves as a companion for this nine-year-old boy in my story called Dayron who is also deaf and he has sort of a spiritual link with the griffin. But I completely forgot about the griffin <laughs> about uh, four or five chapters of his chapters in. So I had to go back and rework so, rework the chapters to make sure that the griffin still has moments. Oh, yeah. Just, it just it doesn't completely disappear all of a sudden. Yeah, it must be. How you kept thread of it all, it's just, it just blows my mind. It's just like, well, how, be... how many characters do you have and how many tales and plot lines interweaving do you have uh a lot of characters i can't count um but in terms of points of view i think about eight or nine yeah M most of them most of them are all from the pagian family so they're all very linked wow. but then some of them are members of other families but it's just their story is important so i felt like it was important to tell them so you have about nine characters in your book that are telling the story from their point of view? Yeah, uh, most of them are from the Pajian family, but then uh, a lot of them are also from other families. And I just felt their stories were important to tell as well. So that's why they're included. And would you describe it as a rollicking good tale? Yeah. <laughs> lots of adventures, lots of fighting. Yeah, there's, uh, there's also one particular character called Damon, who is also a point of view character. And his whole, his whole story is uh, war-oriented. Uh, it involves him and a gang of rangers, people he's never met. So he's, meet, he's meeting them for the first time. 
which of course leads to fun team dynamic that gets all right. And uh, it, it's about them going off in adventures into this desert-like area and um, fighting off th foreign threats. Who was your insp? I mean, obviously we've got from the fantasy point of view, your inspiration, uh, things like, you know, Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, but to write a, a book that contains so many different viewpoints and obviously has a look at human nature, you know, you being only 16, where have you drawn those kind of characters from? Because there's an awful lot there with different, um, and you're talking about team dynamics and things like that, but for what, for one so young, wasn't that difficult? It, it was difficult. I've, I've drawn the inspiration from sort of all sorts of places. Um, for example, with uh, Dayron, who I previously mentioned, uh, Deaf Boy, I... I knew I wanted to explore some form of disability in my novel because I do have some disabled friends who I'm very close to. And I feel like disability is a minority that can be sort of underexplored at times. Uh, and I went with the, I went with him being deaf because I feel like it's one that's never been touched upon in fantasy. I can't think of any deaf characters in fantasy. Mm. It's always interesting because I don't know if you've used this, but um, especially when there's a lot of intrigue going on, if you have a deaf character or you have people who understand sign language, you know, it's that's always an interesting um, side angle. Yeah. Um, his chapters were probably the most fun I had writing because none of them have any dialogue. So it's, it's just me uh, sort of expressing my description my descriptive skills and like my creative abilities oh. i say for, for one so young i think it's it's stunning and some of the topics um that you that you touch on like domestic abuse and things like that you know it's such a wide scope of human experience um that to, for you to put all of that in i think is is pretty phenomenal i have to say so how many pages is it have you got a copy there yeah, I do. Um, it's right here. Oh, it's blood. Okay. Um, but it is, I think, 460 pages. Yeah. Okay, so quite a tome. And how how have your friends and your family, how have they responded knowing that you're now a published author? Yeah, they, they think it's amazing. Um, the support's been incredible. Uh Within the first, uh, I think, 24, 48 hours of my book's release, uh, even with my teachers, I think about 20 maybe teachers uh, purchased my book from my school. Brilliant. Yeah, it's just, it's been incredible. And have they, what have they fed back to you if they, they've read it, they've put, bought it, what have they said to you? Yeah, um, a, a lot of people like the characters, so I think that's my selling point mostly. But yeah, the, the plot is also something that I've heard a lot uh praise for well, so what are your your top three tips for people of your age if they decide oh i want to be an author i want to write a book what are your top three tips for young authors uh okay tip one uh you don't necessarily need to be in the mood for writing when you start because you will definitely get into it while you're writing i think uh because i feel like there were definitely a lot of times where i felt like I wasn't really in the mood to or in the mindset to write a chapter, but then five seconds into writing it, I was hooked. Um, for my second tip, I think, I guess don't be afraid of self-publishing because I feel like it's seen as sort of uh, an easy way to get in, to get your book published. But in reality, you don't get rejected from publishers because your book is bad. You get rejected because... You just don't suit the direction that the, the story doesn't suit the direction that they're taking, which is what you will hear every single time. So, um, yeah, uh, don't be afraid of self-publishing because you can definitely secure a lot of sales with it if you market it correctly. And then, did you come up, sorry to interrupt you, but did you come up against that? Did you try the traditional publishing route? I did, but I never heard any uh, criticisms of the book. They usually just said that they didn't think it was suitable for what they were doing at the moment. So it is mostly just a question of if can you get lucky and uh, fit the path that they want to take. Okay. Uh, and your third tip? I think my third tip would be, 
I, I think I'd just uh, reestablish the importance of proofreading uh, constantly. Every single time you write something, you proofread again. Again. <laughs> over and over and over. Yeah. I mean, is it, is it, was there any point where you felt, oh, no, this is just too much work? Yeah, definitely. But uh, I, I did persevere eventually. <laughs> good good job that you did well i think and i'm i'm going to talk now to any publishers that might be watching this little live stream um and say take a look because you know we've all heard the story of jk rowling who was who was rejected 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 and it was some little publisher that picked up the harry potter and saw the vision and look at look how that turned out and i think that sometimes publishers can be just a little bit too snotty about themselves and a, little bit too, a little bit too highbrow and and extremely limited in vision and I have this same problem with the, the film industry that you know the film industry um currently is tending to remake films over and over again with a new you know the, the only thing that they're going to do new is that oh we're going to put more diverse characters in it and then we're going to create a new epic and it's going to be great because it's diverse it's the same old same old we know that snow white sells you know whether it's got you know a, a white actress or a latino actress or whatever you're going to put in it you know yes it's going to sell however just it's lazy it's lazy 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 and it gets on my nerves so if there's any published out there i think you need to take a look because this story is so rich in characters and look at the, the possibilities look at game of thrones look at lord of the rings these are huge 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 franchises you know for somebody for a publisher to say oh well we're not really going down the fantasy route it's a bit like comedy you know don't be so silly you could be missing the next huge big multi-billion dollar franchise <laughs> hit you between the eyes and you're gonna miss it because you're gonna say oh don't do fantasy rubbish look at it see fantasy. the possibilities see the possibilities it, it just is huge these days and they is. must surely publishers and filmmakers they must be looking for other stories star, Wars, star trek you bloody name it you know look, all of these things they're huge you know star wars is not a small property lord of the rings is not a small property um, all of these, you know, epic sort of fantasy adventures. I mean, if you're going to Harry Potter, you know, on a, on a sort of a more youthful scale. But even so, the fa fantasy action adventures sell. Mm. And if you've got rich characters, you know, it's, and and room for diversity, like you have put in your 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 deaf character. But if you've got a lot of room for diversity, it's going to sell even bigger. So I would implore anybody out there who is either a publisher. Or in film rights and distribution, I know we've got a couple of people in our network who are distributors. Um, take a look at this book and check it out, and just let your imagination run a little bit wild. Dream. Do you dream? Do you dream of that, Dylan? Do you dream? Oh, one day it could be a movie franchise. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it could. On the, on the topic of diversity, I, I do, I, I do definitely agree with your point that it is usually just used as a means of getting money. So I have, I do have black characters in my story. I do have gay characters in my story. So I'm, I'm just trying to make sure that I'm doing diversity right. Yeah, and and that I, oh, hallelujah, amen to that because I really, really, again, it's soapbox time, but I really, really annoys me when big companies just tick the diversity box, and you can see that's all they're doing, um, and they're getting it wrong. And it's yeah, like, but with fantasy, with fantasy, you can have fantastic stories or fa fantasy stories that you can use these actors in. There are a lot of diverse actors out there who can bring their skills to to the place of fantasy or even tell their own stories. You know, such that in Black history, my goodness, there are so many brilliant stories that need to be told that aren't being told, and I don't know why. But in fantasy, you can have anybody. I mean, you can have you can have uh, green people with blue spots and and uh, mythical Avatar. characters, Avatar. mythical humans. Avatar. How many billions did that take? Millions did that take at the box office? Exactly. Yeah. Blue people. You know, <laughs> fantasy people is a big, 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 big genre, and it and it's got the it's got the. Um, capacity to sell 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 and make huge amounts of money not just in the box office but you know streaming and whatever so you know anybody who who says fantasy is not our thing is just so 
Well, it's it's oh, not it's not a lot of people's thing, but it does sell and it's very very popular. Are you? How are your sales going, Dylan? Uh, really good actually. I've made about I think two hundred pounds so far in uh, profit. Yeah. So you, it's only that just gone on sale, right? Yeah, it's been uh, on sale for about a month now, I think, and uh, yeah, they've sold about a hundred copies. Well done, mm. well done. So it's selling for about, <laughs> sorry, Melanie, it's selling for about what, 10, 12 pounds? Yeah, 12. 12, 12, yeah. So again, we've got the details going across uh, the screen. So as I was just saying, hopefully after this interview, you'll sell a lot more. Um, and we'll certainly put, put your put your name out there because I think it's got a lot of potential. And I think, I think that's what's wrong with the world today, both in terms of publishing and film. People don't don't really have the potential to see potential. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, I think many people <laughs> can see the potential of Dylan. I mean, he popped up on my social media news feed and I saw it immediately. I thought, wow, how remarkable. I I think there will be many people out there who will see the potential of Dylan. That's I, I sure. hope so. I hope so. And I want to see this on the screen. Thank you. I want to see it. I want to see it. God damn you. You're listening to me. I, right. to see it. I, I think we need to calm you down. Why don't you get your cards out? Oh, yeah. and this is a game we play with all our, our uh, all the people, our guests on the couch, Dylan. Um, it oh, okay. just sort of makes them think in a, in a, in a, in a, a different way about life and, and the meaning of, yeah. and Melanie just loves this part because um, the cards are very, um, very Steve. soft and, and whatever. They're very soft. They're very soft. Yeah. They're very soft. So, so she, she's going to get her cards down. out. Having, and, and having, a, having a bit of a passionate moment. But yeah. No, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I want to see something good on my telly. There's so much rubbish out there. God. Sell it to Netflix. Netflix could do with some good bloody programs at the moment. Excuse my French. Right. Okay. I'm feeling calmer now. <laughs> good. Calm down. <laughs> right okay so yeah Dylan this is a values jam so this this just gives um your audience a little bit more will give them a little bit more of an insight into you and what's important to you so on these okay. cards are written a value um a value is just what is important to you so I've got lots of different ones that it could be so we're going to shuffle them up I'll get you to pick a card we'll read out what's on that card and then we'll just have a little discussion about how you feel about that particular thing okay right. okay so nothing to swear and again it's just that first this last five minutes of the show so just the first answer that comes into your head don't you don't have to think about it too. there's no right or wrong answer just right. whatever comes into your head right Can okay you... yeah I've, I've never done this before so this is interesting so just say stop when you want me to pick a card stop right. okay what have we got we have got oh okay we have got oops, reliability okay and okay. because we are creative people here we're going to ask you what you think about reliability in a creative way so what does reliability mean to you dylan what does it look feel and sound like uh, yeah, reliability is great importance to me. I think I'd associate it with perhaps like a, I guess a gold color, maybe. Uh, because uh, gold is usually like, if you say someone has, for example, like a golden heart, that that would usually mean that they are quite reliable, and it does have that sort of regal aspect to it, and it does seem quite like praiseable. And I think reliability is definitely something that should be praised, mm -hmm. and um for taste maybe something like a butterfinger i don't know nice <laughs> oh that's stuff. nice yeah all the good <laughs> stuff the nice sort of golden creamy lovely loveliness reliability yeah i like that what does it feel like to you mm. i think weirdly like a curtain because uh because when the uh because curtains usually quite have that quite soft feeling to them and uh and when you like unveil them it shows it, it sort of links the exterior and the interior and i think that is something that links to reliability quite a lot 
Yeah, I like that. I Is like that something that. you'd like to wrap yourself up in? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking of a nice fleecy blanket. That's what it feels like to me. Yeah, it's yeah. the same, same feeling, yeah. Yeah, that, that sort of safe, comfy, cosy feeling. Oh, well, we're out of time. Can't believe it. We've done nearly our hour already. So on that note, on that golden, buttery, snuggly, reliability note, we're going to say goodbye to you, Dylan. Thank you so much for being our guest on the couch today. Thank, Thank you for having me. Um, well, th yeah, thanks for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure meeting you. It really has. And we wish you every, every success. Uh, both Thank you. Your, your book, your future books and your future career as a lawyer as well. And a lawyer. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Until next time, we'll see you. Bye for now. Bye.